This edition of Computer Club Lesson was recorded on May the 11th, 2015. Enjoy! On this edition of Computer Club Lesson, we're going to look at internet service providers in the village and uh, your options for service. We have a question about the Windows 10 upgrade and we'll have a look at internet buffering. All that's next on Computer Club Lesson. Hello, welcome to Computer Club Lesson. This episode is brought to you by the Binary Guys. Okay, good afternoon everybody. In our uh, discussions here before the class has started, um, we've come across uh, not so much a problem, but an opportunity to talk about something that everybody in the village is probably going to want to know something about. And that's what are your alternatives to purchasing uh, internet from the providers that you have. Right now you have uh, source cable, pretty much throughout the village, uh, which has been taken over by Rogers. Um, I personally, I'm not a big fan of Rogers as a company. I don't think they're very consumer friendly. Um, Bell, as an internet service provider, can be a tad expensive. Uh, it's what you you get what you pay for though because in my own home I have uh, the Bell Fiber Internet and I have uh, 50 gigabytes down as a download speed and 10 gigabytes up as an upload speed. Now your upload speed is probably the most important part of your speed uh, of your internet speeds because if you're on a communications um, uh, client like Skype and you're using your camera with Skype, it takes a lot of bandwidth to get that picture up to the internet. So the person on the other end of your connection can see your picture. Now they're getting, you know, sort of a minimum like five megs down, but the real choke point is your upload speed. Okay, so if you've only got 500 kilobytes of upload speed, you're right on the very cusp of what Skype can do with a picture as you're uploading it. Um, it throttles back, it, it uh, deletes a lot of information out of the picture. Sometimes the person on the other end, all they see is like a little blocky picture, stuff like that. So your upload speeds are the most important part of your internet connection. Um, what speeds that you can get from Bell um, depends on the package that you want to buy. Um, like I said, I, I have Bell Fiber at, at my office, so I don't worry about uploads and download speeds. Um, I have a big file come in, boom, it's in. <laughs> it's mine and it's in. I'm not waiting for anything. Um, but that's not really the, the situation with source cable or, Ro or Rogers now, is that uh, your download speeds um, for high-speed internet, I think, are probably uh, 10, uh, 10 megs down and uh, 1 meg up. Now, that's not bad uh, for using a piece of communication software or even uploading your pictures to something like Instagram, which um, you know you're you're uploading your 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 fully processed pictures, which are um, maybe two to four megabytes, you know, in a decent camera. Upload the whole thing to Instagram. It doesn't take too long, but on that slow connection, it's going to take most of the afternoon if you're going to upload ten pictures. So, the other alternative to Bell is anything that um, would be a DSL company, a digital subscriber line. Now, Bell 
has, uh, if, uh, if you as a customer decide that you want a digital subscriber line from another outfit, and there are a few around, uh, you can go to your phone book and, and find a lot of them. Um, Bell has to allow the digital subscriber line to use its line into your house. Okay, so if you have a telephone line in, um, Bell has to let these other companies use that line. They charge that company um, a rate for the data that's coming over it, but it's, it's a wholesale rate, and then the digital subscriber line charges you a retail rate. But a lot of times that retail rate is less than, substantially less than, what you would pay from Bell. Um, there are a few that I would stay away from, but uh, you can ask me about those if you're more interested in a digital subscriber line. I'm, I'd be happy to do the research to tell you what would be the be your best option here in the village. But that's uh, what you can do with it now. If you want to remain on cable as, um, as a subscriber to the internet, you are stuck with whoever the village is um, bringing in uh, over the cable line. The, the, the cable companies do not have to allow uh, another carrier on their line. So you're stuck. You yes? Mean, you mean if, so, if source, say Rogers comes back and our contract comes up, I believe in August, that they're negotiating it right now? You mean Bell can't come in? Oh yes, Bell, Bell is on the telephone lines. They are not on the cable lines. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. so um, I mean cable from Bell. No, you can't get cable from Bell. You, you, it comes in over the telephone line. Um, okay, digital subscriber line is um, any of the internet companies that offer DSL and they come in through the Bell telephone line. Bell has to allow them to give you service over that line. They charge that company a wholesale price and then that company charges you the retail price. Bell makes money, the alternate digital subscriber makes money. And here again, sometimes they can offer you that, that uh, package for substantially less than Bell would offer it. Is Verizon one of those? The uh, well, Verizon is not in Canada. Oh. Okay, they were coming. Um, the yeah. government gave them, gave them such heat, and uh, public opinion gave them such heat that they're not going to do it. But is that what they are? One of those? Yeah, they they could come in as an internet service provider, and Bell would be obligated to carry their bits over their telephone lines to your house, um, Verizon would be obligated to pay the, um, the wholesale rate for those bits, but then they would charge you a retail rate for those bits. So we have source ca a cable right now. Yes. So if Bell wanted to give me Bell um, cable, they would have to use sources cable line? Well, yes, um, that's the way it would work if the law allowed for it, but it doesn't. Um, Bell is not, uh, or any other internet service provider over cable is uh, locked out of the, ser the cable service provider for your geographic area. They have a monopoly. They have a monopoly for cable. On telephone, it's quite another story. This all goes back to the days of dial-up. Okay, you could get internet service from anybody over the telephone line if you had a dial-up modem. Uh, no matter whether it was Bell or anybody. As a matter of fact, I still carry um, dial-up service from an outfit in Waterloo as an absolute last resort emergency 
to get an internet connection for a client. I can still do it. If, it's, if I need to check that internet connection or get a small file to make the, the client's computer work, I can still get it through a dial-up connection. So slow. <laughs> it's painful. <laughs> it's painful. But in an absolute emergency, I can do it. Now, the other thing that I can do, and I'm doing it right now, is I can tether my computer to my telephone because it also has an internet connection. Okay? And so when I ask for bits on this computer, I'm getting them from my telephone. Now, I pay an awful lot of money a month to be able to do that. Here again, it's for uh, the clients that I have. If, I, if it's an absolute emergency and their internet connection is not working and I need a file to make their computer work, I can get it through this. I can get it through this. And as a matter of fact, with my Mac, I can make the client's computer work because this computer has what's called internet connection sharing. No matter where it gets the internet connection from, I can share it out of my Mac to another computer. And you're not even in India. And I'm not even in India. <laughs> now be nice. Be nice. <laughs> no, no, I wasn't being It's true. <laughs> it's true. They hook up to your computer and they have yeah, access to I, Yeah, I, I, can do the, I can do that from my office as well. And that's what you're yeah. doing. Yeah, and that's what I'm doing. Um, on the sharing, like mine's got sharing on it. I don't use it, but it's got sharing on it. So well, if um, you can use internet connection sharing, um, from your laptop to wherever, but it has to be wired in. It has to have an Ethernet cable going from your computer to another computer. It, uh, it, it could be done over a wireless connection, but boy, is that tough to do. It's, so the, eas the easiest way to do it is, is if you need to share your internet connection with another computer, you have to have an ethernet cable to do it. Okay, from one computer to the other. Um, one other option uh, that's very expensive is satellite. You can get an internet connection through a satellite service provider. That's very, very expensive. It's very expensive and the speeds are limited, and the latency of the connection is very, very high. Uh, you would use that connection probably only for something like getting your email. Because what happens is, in fact, with, a, with um, satellite, there are two connections. One, the downlink, and that's where you get your download speed from the downlink. And so you might get uh, 1.2 or 1.3 megs of download speed from a satellite link. But how do you tell the satellite that you're asking for information? This is where it gets tricky. When you type in on your keyboard uh, an internet address, that is uploaded at telephone modem speed. Now, just uh, if it's just text, a few little pieces of text, that goes relatively quickly because the, there's not very many bits in there. I mean, you can put in a full page of text, and if you look at the size of it, it might be um, 250 kilobytes. Well, if, you're, if you've got uh, a modem speed of 56 kilobytes, divide that into the 250, it takes five seconds to upload that complete page of text. But keystrokes are even faster. But it takes time, folks. It takes time for that 
signal from your keyboard to go to the facility that is that is using where you're using the satellite internet connection to tell your satellite connection to download mail okay it takes time the 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 latency speed of that kind of connection is about two and a half or three seconds in the world of the internet that is a half a lifetime <laughs> because in most in most internet connections if you do what's called a ping you you send a quick signal out to the internet to see how long it takes to come back it's 13 or 14 15 a really high latency would be 20 milliseconds okay millionths of a second divide that into two or three or four seconds you'll see that that becomes half a lifetime in internet speed so there's another alternative for those that might live out in the boondocks in the middle of northern Alberta you might be able to get an internet connection there as a matter of fact you can get that same internet connection at the North Pole. What are these, on the telephone poles around the city, you see signs saying internet 1995, what's that? Okay. Um, that is also probably DSL advertising uh, to say you can, you can get an internet connection for 20 bucks a month for the first six months. <laughs> And then after that, you'll pay a little bit more, maybe $40. So you've got to be careful about these things. Uh, you might get five megabits uh, of download speed. Uh, I would, if you're going to use a DSL company uh, as an alternative, alternative to Bell, I would make sure you got as a minimum five megabits. If, if they can't offer that, then don't go with them because your speed will just be too slow to do anything meaning, meaningful with your computer. Yeah, but it's, it's usually a six month uh, introductory price. I would say that DSL, um, a good DSL company should offer you um, inter an internet connection of five megabytes and offer you that connection for around 35 or $40 a month where a bill might be 60 or 65. Okay, so that's, that's the offerings of what you can get for internet service. There are other ways to do it as well. Um, let us just say that um, five people on your block would get together and buy one service from Bell Internet. You paid the $100 a month and you got a connection speed of 50 megs down and 10 megs up. You're all, I mean, this, this is just great, but it's going to one house and one person is paying. Yeah. You can all get together as a collective and say, let's get the best router that we can get and put it in this guy's house and we will help him share the bill. We get 50 megs down and we pay a portion of his bill. So if five people going in on it, 20 bucks a month or $25 a month. That's... I would say more than five on that connection. Um, you're really starting to degrade the connection. So that's an alternative too. It's all done with a router. With the router. Yeah. Do you, do you each get a router then? Yes, you would each have to have a router, oh, but it would just be close enough. Just close enough to get that signal. With your Wi-Fi. Huh? Yes. Oh, to get your Wi-Fi signal. Okay. So my neighbor could get my Wi-Fi right now. If you allowed him to get on it. Yes. How would I allow them? I mean, is that You would you would leave an open Wi-Fi signal. In other words, it would not be password protected. Yeah. Okay. Because that's what you do when you go to Yeah. 
Exactly. But, but in this instance, you, uh, if, say, five or six of you got together as a group and the five or six of you could see each other's houses uh, with a Wi-Fi signal, you could make that signal secure just by simply putting a good password on all of the routers. Okay? So that same good password goes on all the routers. Um, Exactly. Now, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're going back to the Stone Age a little bit. Yeah. However, um, you have to be really, really knowledgeable uh, about how to hack into systems to see what other people are doing um, on their computers in, in the neighborhood. Uh, you have to be really knowledgeable to do it, and uh, so so I would say that all of you are safe, except from a guy like me. Can they all have their own encryption key? Yes. To protect it? Yes. From each other? Yes. You can do that too. That solves the problem. And, and this router that you need, is it the one that we have now? No, no, it, it would be something uh, relatively fairly expensive. It, uh, you'd have to pay somewhere in the neighborhood maybe of $120 for each router. You'd soon recoup, soon recoup that, money. that money back from the cheaper, ha having the cheaper access to... Um, you have to know your neighbors to you know what to do. Yeah, I mean you have to form like a little consortium to do this. But it can be done. Um, I, I'm surprised that um, I don't see a lot more Wi-Fi signals in the village than I do. Um, I would say that maybe only about 10% uh, of the homes in the village have a Wi-Fi router. Oh, it's the router? Yeah, it's the router. It's the wireless router that's doing the heavy lifting. No, you would buy your, your router outright, mm -hmm. and then you would chip in, all of you chip in, uh, you know, your percentage yeah. of the cost of the internet connection. Well, I mean, like you said, you have a, have a Wi-Fi now, all, all it means is you have that router, is it? No, uh, I, when I got my laptop, my daughter said, well, just hook up to Wi-Fi, and I said, okay, so I called 310 to surf. Yeah, and they turn the Wi-Fi on in, in, your, in your modem. It's, it's there automatically. But, uh, but um, the, the, in, you know, in the household modems that, uh, that are offered, uh, the, the newest ones come with, with uh, Wi-Fi built into them, um, Wi-Fi routers built into them. But uh, for this kind of connection that I'm talking about to work, yeah. You really do have to have uh, a really solid, high strength, costly yeah. Wi-Fi router to make it work. And it has to be put in, a, in, in places where everybody can see it. I, you know, wireless, uh, wireless routers, their signals don't like walls. Okay, so if, if you've got your Wi-Fi router in your basement way over there, and the signal has to go through four walls and a, and, and, um, and a floor to get to you, it's going to be a little weaker than it would ordinarily be. So in, in that case, you would move the Wi-Fi router to some place where you got a good signal throughout your house. The mo uh, and uh, the newest routers out there, um, their, um, their protocols and their power uh, ratios are very high now, so you you can get pretty much the 300 feet that they offer um, from just about any place in so your if home. you want that in your house, you don't, do you not plug in your computer then to anything? No, no, it's all wireless. It's going to come to you as, as a wireless signal. Um, uh, actually, uh, what would happen is the wireless router would, would pick up the signal from somewhere else, from another home, and then you could have a wire going from that access point to your computer, and now you're now sharing. So, um, like I said, the the cost would be the cost of the router to buy, 
and then you um, you kick in your percentage of the cost of carrying the internet service to someone else's house. And everybody's in on it. Okay? And you'd have to come and set all that up. Huh? Yes. <laughs> yes, I would set that kind of thing up and, and uh, okay, I mean, you know, you, you don't have to use me, but, you know, it would be less expensive if you did. <laughs> Yes. And what they gave me to satisfy me was 15 meg high speed continuous forever and um, 15 meg and a new router they just installed. Now, well, that's that's a pretty good deal is for. That, is that router the kind that you're talking about? Um, I have Wi-Fi. Yeah, um, the newest routers from Bell are pretty pretty good about the signal that they put out. Um, they're, they're still, uh, it's a wireless signal that hates walls. It's just the, the, the radio band that the, wire, that the wireless router is using. It just doesn't like to go through walls and furniture. Um, so you would, uh, you're okay. You you're probably can get everywhere in your house um, from that. Yeah. Uh, anywhere with it and probably out on your deck. I also have a, a, a so that's the advantage, that's why you want to have it so you're portable? Yeah, the portability is why you would have it. Yeah. No, it's because my XP is going to be outdated. You know mine too. It already is. Yes, we are all, we, we, all, we all have, we all have issues with Windows XP and I have most of the issues with it. But, um, like I said, um, for Windows XP, please wait until I give you the word yeah. to when, it's, when it's good to go and buy uh, a new computer with Windows 10. And I will give you the word on that as soon as I'm satisfied that it, it's, uh, it's okay to buy it without problems. Are they going to upgrade 8 and 8.1? One? 8.1 one will be upgraded to Windows 10. Uh, what, Windows 7, I believe, in um, in um, Pro and above will be upgraded to Windows 10. I'm 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 hearing different things about Windows 7 Home Premium. Yeah, whether it's going to be upgraded or not. But even if it's not, okay, I don't think that that Microsoft will charge you much more than 60 bucks for the upgrade from Windows 7 to Windows 10. I don't think that upgrade will be much more than 60 bucks. But it will be a free upgrade from Windows 8.1. Now the other thing that you have to remember is that uh, the upgrade will not be available for any 32-bit operating systems, which is what Windows XP is. And some instances of Windows 7 are 32-bit because they're running on older hardware that cannot support 64 bits. If um, if your computer is capable of 64 bits, it will give you the option. If it's not capable, it's 32 bits, folks. If, if you check and see what's installed on your computer, I will show you how to do that right now. You just right click on my computer and you go to properties and it will open a panel saying what you have here and what I have is Windows 7 Professional Service Pack 1 and it is 32 bits 32 bits because this computer is not capable or would run very very slowly on 64 bits and so when I when I loaded Windows 7 onto this computer, it just made that determination by itself that 32 bits is what you are and we can't do anything more for you. And that also, that also has a bearing on how much memory you can put into a computer. If you have a 64-bit operating system, the memory that you can put in is almost unlimited. Well, it's unlimited by the fact of what the motherboard will support. It can be as much as, as 16 gigs. 
Uh, most motherboards don't support much beyond 16, but it could be. In Windows 32-bit operating systems, the computer cannot see anything beyond 4 gigs. It can't see it. It's, it's the way the operating system works. That 32 bits cannot see the internal memory beyond 4 gigs. So there, there, those are the two restrictions, but uh, I'm not worried about it. I'll have a new computer if I want Windows 10 anyway. So that's how you do that. You uh, right click on my computer and you can, if you don't have the icon on your desktop, you can go to the start menu, start menu, and there is my computer there. You can do the same thing, right click on it and go to properties and it will bring up that page for you to show you what you have. Okay, any other questions about internet service providers and what we can do to make our lives a little better with them? It's not easy, but it can be done. All right, any other questions? That if you go to another provider, though, so like we're all probably bundled in uh, with the internet, the phone, and... Uh, yeah. And television. And television, yeah. Yeah. If you go to another provider, you won't have this bundle. Yeah, you won't have your bundles, um, but then you have to start doing a little math. And that's really all it is. Mm -hmm. The math is not going to lie to you. What, what are you paying for bits? What are you paying for channels? What are you paying for your telephone? Now, I must tell you that uh, a lot of younger folks around don't have landline telephones anymore. They have this. This is it, a cell phone. Why would I need a landline telephone if I have this on me 24-7? So they don't buy it. Well, that's okay too, uh, but don't get me wrong when I say this, uh, but the folks in the village are a little more advanced <laughs> in millennia, <laughs> and that landline in your home is a good safety measure. It's a good safety yeah. measure. It's nice to have that cell phone. I mean, and the other part of it is, is that, uh, well, the part that's the safety measure is if the power goes out in your home, usually that telephone still works. Not if you have uh, source. Yeah. Okay, then it's, your telephone is coming in over the internet and it needs to be powered. If you, had, if you have a bell line that's coming in over their, their telephone line, um, if the power goes down, that telephone is still going to work. Now, your cell phone will, will still work if the power goes down uh, because um, it's got a, uh, a charge in it, okay, which will last you a day. Then you have to find a way to recharge it. You can take it out to your car and you can sit there and listen to the Blues Brothers on the radio and recharge your cell phone for four hours and you'll get another day out of it. <coughs> When we had that big power failure years ago, what was it now? It's got to be almost 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I did. I took my cell phone out to my car, and uh, for four hours, I sat there and let the car idle, <laughs> charged my phone. Uh, well, actually, I didn't have to. All I had to do was just turn the, turn the key on, and, and I got power from my phone. Um, so that's another good safety measure of, of a cell phone and the telephone system. And um, the, the cell service providers made sure that they had power going to their cell towers. Uh, they have on-site power backups for just about all of them. If the power quits, the, the, uh, they have power at the tower. So it's that safety thing. If you have a landline telephone, uh, from uh, Bell and it's coming in over telephone wires. That's a safety thing for you in your home. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, anything else about internet service providers? Yes. You know, I have the problem when I watch 
watching some video. Yes. The internet is gone. And okay, I, it's very slow and it's choppy, or it just quits altogether. I don't know. I know so good in, in computers. I used to have the stationery. Now my daughter gave me the laptop, and uh, I don't know why. And so I have to go back, pushing the, the little thing, and put in my name again and charge it again. I don't know why I'm doing that. I call the. I am in search source sources. Yeah, you're on source cable. Um, from what you're describing, there may be several reasons why that's happening. Um, the first thing you have to understand in this neighborhood, in the village, if you're on source cable, you're sharing with everybody else. Okay? You're sharing your internet connection with maybe 50 other people on your block. Yes, you are. There's a bulk cable that comes in, uh, let's, let's call it this, it's a fat pipe that's coming into uh, a facility in the village. Um, and there may be four or five or six of them in the village that, that's coming to each neighborhood. And then each neighborhood takes a branch off that, or each house takes a branch off that pipe. Now think about it for a second. You've got this big fat pipe, but if everybody is using all of the water out of it, then everybody is only getting a trickle. So that's why I said that's the analogy of sharing this internet connection. So maybe it's the time of day when you're trying to watch this um, that everybody else is watching Netflix and they're taking all the bandwidth. Sometimes in the morning, sometimes I watch uh, some stuff from, from Italy or from South America. Yeah. And put the video and, and after the call. They said, your service is something like that. Sorry, my English is not good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so um, I don't know what to do. I have to go on again. Press yes. Phone. Yeah. You, you have to restart it and make uh, another connection. Uh, sure. Um, now, another thing about video over the internet, um, especially through a computer, uh, computer connection, um, is that um, there is a problem with what we call buffering. Um, and buffering, it, for you that have ever seen it, is that you bring up a web page, you start to watch a video, and then the video stops, and you've got this little wheel going yeah. around yeah. inside the middle of it. Okay, it's it's yeah. it's the computer is using the video faster than the computer can get it from the internet. That's what's happening. So um, let us just say that you're using one megabyte a minute to sit, to watch your video. One megabyte. Maybe the computer connection to what you want to watch is only coming in at 750 kilobytes, three quarters of that speed. So the computer will use up its one megabyte in about a minute, and then it will take some more as fast as it can get it. But at some point or other, it says, wait a minute, I've run out of picture here. I've got to stop. And so that's when the little wheel starts. It's waiting for more signal. That is a problem in and of itself with the internet. Um, computer scientists and engineers are working away at trying to get a fix for this, but it's been a problem with the internet now for many years, and the more we watch video, the more problems we have with buffering. It's being resolved but slowly. But there's nothing wrong with your machine. There's, that, there's uh, nothing wrong with your machine. There's nothing wrong with your computer when that's happening. It's just that the internet signal has come in so slow that the computer has run away with it. It's used, uh, used up all of what you got in that first minute, and it's sitting there waiting for more. I want more. I want more. And if it doesn't get it, if it doesn't get the more in a specified time, it will just shut the connection off. Okay. Um, 
someday I am going to uh, do a talk on internet buffering uh, and how it really works. It's simple enough when you see it in action. And it's simple enough when I, when I give you the mathematics involved. It's just really, it's adding and subtracting. You know, there's nothing beyond that. But um, and that's really what it is. The, the, the computer is using the video faster than it can get it. And so you get these bufferings. If you're listening to music, that's probably not going to happen. You're, you're getting the music file as fast as the computer can use it. But video is another story. I bring it here because I can do anything. Yeah? And now, you know, you go to the corner and go closer or restart. Everything disappears. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. I don't know where I can take it for weeks. Well, talk to me after the class is over and we'll see what can be done for you. I can have a look at it and see if there's anything yes, that I can do with it. Communication, my daughter is in Argentina, so they just call me and send me stuff. And I go, my mama, what you did? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> she used to be my head for the time. So yeah. I, well, when, when tech support... When she was in university, I go to the room. Oh, what you did now? <laughs> you didn't talk anything. And what you did now? I don't know. I don't know. Well, now that you're in the village, you, you have me for tech support. Oh, thank but you. unfortunately, I am not free. Okay, it's nice that everybody has free tech support somewhere, but when you're really stuck, unfortunately, I'm not free. Okay, but I will have a look and, and see if I can, if there's something I can do. Okay, anything else? Got a few minutes yet. Uh, what can we talk about uh, with... Uh, I just mentioned to you that I tried for my sound. I, I didn't get any, any uh, any when you pulled the speakers out? But when I pulled it out all together, there's sound coming from my computer. Okay, then there's something wrong with your speakers. Yeah. You need to buy new speakers. Yes? I still have 28 updates that are optional. Should I ignore them still? Yes, optional updates you can ignore. Okay. Uh, the, yeah, the computer is not going to install them because they are optional, uh, unless you tell it to. Yeah. Um, and uh, optional updates you can ignore. At, that, at some point or other, one or two of them might turn into uh, an update that is critical, and they will just and and they will just load automatically. Um, I did a scan last night, a full scan on my laptop. Yes. From uh, with with uh, what were you using to scan it? Just a full scan on my computer. But what program were you using? Windows. Like, um, well, I do a scan on my XP. Just, yeah, I think you're you're using a vast, right? No, it's defender. Okay. Defender. Um, so the reason, and you're using XP. No, no, this is on at eight one. Eight one, okay. Um, I haven't done one for a couple of months, so I thought I should. I haven't done a full scan, right? So I yeah. was really surprised the length of time it took. Um, that surprises me too because um, Windows Defender, um, the way it works is it looks in the most likely places, and uh, for, for uh, malware and spyware and scumware. Um, and that most likely place is usually your user accounts, which um, in this instance, I've just opened up the user account for this computer. And all the, in, you're not going, unless you activate it, you're not going to see this folder in your user account. Yeah. Well, it's called app data. App data. Oh, I see. Yeah. All right. Now that folder is hidden from you because you shouldn't be fiddling with it. And I'm not. Okay. But it's, <laughs> it's hidden from you. But um, in a lot of cases, 
Um, the stuff that you see in app data, there, there are many, many, many folders hidden in the background, as you can see. And a lot of times, um, spyware, malware, and scumware will ensconce itself here in that hidden folder. Now your, your antivirus, your anti-malware, is going to look through that folder. Okay. It's looking through a lot more folders than what you know about. Okay, that's why it's taking so long. Um, and um, there could very well be other uh, folders in here. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, the scan was complete. The scan was complete, and, and it found nothing, or it found something. It, I don't think it said. Well, if it if it found something, it would have told you all about it. Oh, okay. Okay. It was being more obvious. Yeah, okay. yeah. So uh, taking six hours for a full scan, um, I've seen it uh, on some computers that I've uh, done virus scans on. It takes quite a while, and other ones are done in 20 minutes. I know on my XP, I do one every, pretty much every Saturday. Yeah, Saturdays. and you're using a VAS to do it, right? No, AVG. AVG? Okay, fine. And I'm still, still using Sandbox. Yeah. And it takes maybe an hour and a half, two hours. Yeah, that's because your computer, your hard drive is relatively slow. Um, oh, but that's well, that's just the speed of your hard drive doing that. I can't remember. I don't use that. Never use that sandbox because I forget when I went. It used to say wait a minute or something or whatever. And so I've never used it. Yeah, it's. Um, we talked about sandbox. Um, oh, it's got to be almost two years ago now, right? Yeah. We're talk about it again. It's on, yeah. It's on yeah. On well, I suppose we could talk about it again. I mean, sandbox uh, is still. Available for for the more modern 8.1 and uh, operating systems, and and I do recommend that you use it in the Windows environment. It's just another way to keep the nasties out of your computer because uh, essentially Internet Explorer is locked down in Sandbox. It cannot be changed, and anything that comes at your computer through Internet Explorer cannot get a foothold on your computer to make changes without authorization. Yeah. Well, we can have another look at it um, in, uh, in the weeks to come. Yeah. In the weeks to come, we'll have another look at it. A minute ago, when you said it took so long for my XP to do the scan, it's because it's the drivers? No. Is that what you said? No. So no. It's, it's, it's because there are a, a lot of hidden folders on your computer and the, the antivirus, anti-malware program is going through each folder, each file it finds in it yeah. and, and it's looking at them and making an index of what it finds. And that's maybe why it was slow, so slow the first time around. It's, it's indexing everything it finds. Yeah, but the, the other one online with ABG that takes an hour and a half in there, you said, well, that's because of my drivers. No, your hard drive. Yes, the hard drive is relatively slow on that old so computer. When they say upgrade, upgrade your hard drives, you said that the hard drives never change. No, no, there, um, you're not uh, you're not upgrading your hard drive. You can't. It's a, it's a it's a mechanical piece. That's what I thought. So yeah. Sometimes, like you get those windows, and they say. Uh, oh, I know what you're talking about yeah, now. Say, um, you, you're on the internet, and something saying, pops up. And it looks for all the world like your, um, like, 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 like your Windows Explorer. Yes. It looks for all the world like it. Yes. And a little thing is going across the top saying scanning, scanning, scanning. And all of a sudden it says, I found this, found this, found this, found this, found this. Found this. And the next thing you know, there's 2,600 um, pieces of malware on your computer. And a big green button that says, fix now. And if you touch that button, stuff is going to happen, and it's not good. Okay? But what you are really seeing, what you are really seeing is a web page. And that web page is playing a movie. 
and that big green button is a link in the middle of the web page to take you to somewhere else that says we'd be happy to fix you up for money. It's all about the money folks. I've said it over and over and over and I'll say it again. It's all about the money. <clears throat> and if you touch that button, stuff will be downloaded on your computer that they are saying, well, we're going we're to use this program to fix it and that program to fix it. And while you're at it, we think you really might like to have, and it loads five other things. All of which will get in the way of you having a good time with your computer. So that's what's happening here. Um, if you see one of those windows, you can, with some confidence, go up to the, to the red X over here and click it. But the other way to do it, the better way to do it, is it will, uh, you will see your Internet ex uh, Explorer window open. Okay, and here it comes. It's just going to load Google for me. But uh, think of, of this as the movie playing in this screen, which is what you're seeing. The better way and the safer way to get rid of it rather than touch anything. Because sometimes it doesn't matter where you touch on the page, it's going to take you to this buy me now and download stuff. So what you want to do is you want to go down here on the taskbar to where you see Internet Explorer or whatever window has opened and you want to right click on it and when you do that you have an option to close window okay and that's what you want to do the other thing that you want that you can do and it's the safest method is to right click anywhere on the taskbar where there's a little free space Okay, and we're going to start Task Manager. Um, and if you, if you right click, you will get an option to start Task Manager. And that's what I'm going to do right here. We'll start Task Manager, and it opens up um, under the Applications tab. If it, if it opens up somewhere else like the Processes, click on the Applications tab. That's what's running on your computer right now, okay? And you can close that program. As a matter of fact, it'll tell you what it is. It'll tell you it's, it's Google or Windows Internet Explorer or whatever it is. You, you uh, highlight that program, and then you click on End Task. And as soon as you do that, it goes away. That's the safest way to do it, because like I said, if you touch anywhere else on that, on that funky window that's coming up, um, it will trick you into doing something else. But once you've closed it, you're out of danger pretty much. Okay? That, yeah, to get to the get to the task manager, there there are two ways to get to it, um, but the fastest way, and the easiest way is to right click on the task bar at the bottom, and then you have an entry for task manager. Um, in in your case, um, if you do the three finger salute, Control Alt Delete, okay, it will bring up a little tab that says, do you want to start task manager yeah. or log out? Yeah. So the other way you just tick, click on the point. Yeah, I'm going to do the control alt delete right here. There it is. Okay, in my case, it takes you back to a page where you can start task manager. Um, and if you click on start task manager, it brings back your window and task manager is open. But this is the easiest way to do it, to start, from, to start task manager from the task bar. Now if your computer has become unresponsive, um, no matter what you what X you click on, you can't close anything, then uh, as a matter of fact, if you right click 
on the task bar and you can't get the task manager entry to come up, then control alt delete is what you want to do. That gets you to task manager and what task manager is is a, is a program that that's running at the very core of Windows. Okay, is not many things out there that can keep task manager from running and once you've got it up you can get control of your computer again. Even if it takes even if it, um, it's restarting your computer, okay, because there is an option to restart. Okay, here's Task Manager. Uh, where was it? Once you have Task Manager up, you can click on New Task and just temp simply type in the word there, Shut Down. And your computer will shut itself off. If you can't get it to do it with the mouse, this is the way to do it safely. Type in the word Shut Down under new task. Okay, um, we've pretty much uh, beat up the hour. Yeah. And uh, now, next week is the holiday. Yeah, there will be no class next week. Uh, Fred will send out an email to remind you. Yeah. <laughs> Well, there's plenty of time for that. I'll have it up and running in a day or two, I hope. Oh, yeah. Doesn't does the village, like the management, have Wi-Fi? Uh, they may have it in some of their buildings. Why can't we pipe in this one? <laughs> we can't be cut into theirs. Yeah. That's brilliant. Well, it's, it's a great idea, but it won't work. <laughs> uh, number one. Yeah. <laughs> Number one, Wi-Fi is, is, at its maximum is, uh, can give you a good connection at 300 feet line of sight. Yeah. Okay, so beyond 300 feet, the, the signal just falls off to nothing. We can't put all of them. No, no, it's not going to work. <laughs> now, the, there, there is one thing that can be done. Um, and and the if you see a really, really weak signal and you want to get to it, you can make a Pringles can into a Wi-Fi antenna. Now that is a hack. Maybe someday I'll show you the video on how to make a Wi-Fi antenna from a Pringles can. It's really easy. You can do all kinds of things with Pringles cans. Yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> That's Computer Club lesson for today. Thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye.